Okay, beautiful. So just remember, this is week seven, we're doing cerebral and we're doing endocrine. And there really are pretty much combined. You think of cerebral, you think pituitary gland, a lot of stuff to do with endocrine and you know the way it regulates the body. So um, I'm gonna be talking over the cahoots a little bit more than normal because I want you all to understand it. So let's see how you all can do. And I know you've been studying for an exam. So I know that this is one of those things where you're gonna guess a lot, but there is a lot of surge two stuff in here. Many of you have, um, we'll see. These courses are pretty well closely aligned for you. Oh, now we have a pig, cool. <laughs> No, I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I thought the glasses were cool. I'm just having way too much fun for my own good. Yeah, I know it's okay. But after exam, you are more than, please go for I'm it. I'm just coping over here. <laughs> you know, coping is awesome. All right, let's get going and let's try to get her done as soon as we can today. Week seven, I'm still impressed with week seven. Growth hormone is administered by what root? Now the pituitary gland secretes a horse growth hormone. Sometimes children are very short in stature and the parents aren't. So it has to do with there's not enough growth hormone. So they give this to these children Sometimes it's daily, sometimes it's every other day. It all depends on the physician, but it is a sub-Q injection that these children go through. And they continue on growth hormone until they stop growing less than one inch per year. So usually about that pre-adolescent growth spurt time is when they usually they'll continue through that and then after they stop. And Hannah was quick on that one. Highest priority for a diagnosed patient with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. And you're gonna go, oh my God, S-I-A-D-H, what is this? Let's look at the words. Inappropriate antidiuretic. Diure diuretics make urine. Anti is against urinating. So too much not urinating hormone, okay? So if we're looking at this sort of diagnosis, we're going to be concerned about intake output. We're going to be concerned about water retention, right? We're going to be limiting fluids, limiting salt. We're going to be monitoring blood pressure, listening to those breath sound. Too much fluid is going in, depending on the patient's status. If they're young, you know, they probably can handle it. The old, no. So which of the following are signs of syndrome of inappropriate anti-diuretic hormone? Again, anti-urinating, not urinating hormone, making the body not urinate. And again, it's that decreased urine output, really good. Does that make more sense, understanding the words of that? Because we make too much of it, of what is it, where does it come from? But we need to know nursing care and what does it do? And that's basically it. So what is important to cover when teaching the family about propothiacil, or it's also called PTU? This is a drug given for hyperthyroidism. So as we are teaching a, a patient or family about it, we need to let them know that it does cause leukopenia, which means they're more susceptible to fevers or throats being sick. So, and especially in today's population and COVID, et cetera, we really need to let them know to be more careful, wash hands, you know, around people sick, be very careful, et cetera. An initial sign of diabetes insipidus is, again, this is a pituitary gland. You know, we've got, you know, uh, anterior and posterior lobes and they all do different things. But diabetes insipidus has not a darn thing to do with sugar. I can't tell you how many nurses check blood sugars as they're giving me these patients and I'm going, well, why did you check a blood sugar? Well, it's diabetes and I'm like, 
okay, obviously you don't understand diabetes insipidus. It's your thirsty, 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 urinate, 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 urinate. So polydipsia, polyuria are signs of diabetes insipidus. Treatment, vasopressin. How would we know vasopressin worked? Our urine output would decrease, right? Very simply. Multi-select. What are the clinical manifestations of juvenile hypothyroidism? Now, hypothyroidism, children, adults, it doesn't matter. They're, they're about the same. Just about. But the difference between adults and children is, remember, adults are already at their growth and their height that they're going to be. Children still need to grow and they need that thyroid hormone to be able to get and grow to where they should be. So um, clinical manifestations, dry and skin, thinning hair, constipation, decreased growth, you know, as adults, cold intolerance, right? These are things, dry skin, all of what you see in adults is kids also, but it's that decreased growth. You know, um, they're not going to grow as much without the hormone. So a child has a simple febrile seizure. What education would you provide the parents? Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a child go through a febrile seizure. It is not a fun thing. And parents are extremely scared. And they're going to ask you, does this mean my child have epilepsy? And the answer is no, not until you have multiple seizures. So febrile seizures are when you go from a normal temperature to a big temperature, like 20 minutes. So it's the rate of rise, how quickly you got a fever. So what are we going to teach them? Well, if they're going to have a seizure, number, you're going to monitor the temperature, et cetera, but that'll drive parents crazy. My daughter-in-law, has a firstborn son had febrile seizures. She carries thermometers around with her and medicine all the time, almost to the point of like five times a day, what's the temperature of your child? And she absolutely knows it. But he finally grew out of that stage because it's usually six months to about six years old. And then, then hopefully that will grow out of it. But always any child, whether they're febrile, regular seizures, those safety precautions, turn them to the side, protect that airway and you don't jam anything in the mouth. It's all you're doing is protecting an airway, protecting from injury. What type of seizure is when the body is jerking, you're foaming at the mouth and the child is rendered unconscious. And when you think of children who have epilepsy, you, you think of this sort of seizure. And that's called tonic clonic, very good. Again, protect them from injury during the procedure, you know, when they're having that seizure. After a fall, what assessment would be considered a neurological emergency? You know, children have come into my ER, they've fallen off of second floor balconies, fallen off of roofs, you know, and of course we're gonna be doing neuro checks. So if I see this, what's going I gonna do? I'm immediately gonna make sure the neurosurgeon is there. If you have a one eye different from the other and it's a fixed big dilated pupil, there's pressure in that brain. And it's usually due to blood occupying space that shouldn't be there. So what do they do? They'll do surgery and they'll remove the hematoma. But that fixed dilated pupil, if we don't fix it quick, it's gonna be permanent. That's why it's an emergency. With a patient with a head injury, the signs of increased intracranial pressure include, when you have kids falling down, that you have them, um, sports injuries are a lot where they slide into third base and they hit their knee into the, you know, their, their head into the knee of a defender. And you can see they've gone really fast. And we're watching them. So what do we know uh, what to look for? Well, these children will start with, it's sort of like an amnesia. They'll start, well, was I safe? Did I make it to third? Or we've left the game now, did we win the game? Or, you know, is my dad coming? Um, 
asking that question over and over and over again. That would be considered a change in consciousness. Not when they just go unconscious, but those questionings over and over again. What notable sign may indicate increased intracranial pressure in an infant? You know, infants are special. They can't tell you that they have headaches. I mean, they can show you they're vomiting. That's one thing, but um, how would we know? I mean, respiratory, we see flaring, we see grunting. We know they're in trouble when we hear that grunt, but with increased intracranial pressure, they start giving this cry. When they start to cry, it's unlike a normal baby's cry. It's nails on a chalkboard. It's really high, it's pitched. And whenever you get into you know, the nursery and you hear a baby cry that has neuro problems, you're gonna go, oh, that baby is neuro only because of the cry, it's very high pitched. And then you go and do neuro checks, et cetera, et cetera. All of the following increase intracranial pressure, except what? And we need to know if we're doing these procedures to a patient and the patient has a head injury, what do we need to be careful about? Doesn't mean we don't do them, it just means we have to be more careful. And blood pressure um, or heart rate has nothing to do with increased intracranial pressure, but touching, turning, coughing, suctioning, all of that stuff is you're touching that patient and anything you do to touch is gonna increase pressure. And Cody's the brain today. Which of the following signs and symptoms are more common in children then adults following a head trauma. And this is something that I didn't know. You know, adults and children both fall down, same fall, same place. Children are gonna respond differently than do adults. And adults don't vomit like children do. You know, children will fall down, get a, get a good, you know, um, head trauma, and they'll start vomiting. Adults takes a lot, lot more for that to happen. So we can't regulate adults on nausea and vomiting and head injury. Children, we can. What medication may be used for a child with cerebral edema due to a fall? Well, cerebral edema, what is it? It's swelling of the brain. We need to decrease that swelling. And what medication is appropriate to the brain to relieve the fluid. And it's mannitol. Now, furosemide is good for peripheral edema or congestive failure, yeah, but brain specific diuretic mannitol, okay? Ray syndrome, what's that? So it's caused by aspirin. It is a metabolic disorder and it occurs in children. That's why we don't give aspirin to children unless they have Kawasaki disease. And then we need that aspirin because we need to thin the blood and prevent clots. Febrile seizures usually occur in what ages? And that six months to six years, very good. You were listening, good job. Childhood hypopituitarism results in which condition? And that's dwarfism. That means they're not getting enough growth hormone and it does cause pituitary dwarfism. Can it be changed with this growth hormone injection? Maybe they'll be a little bit taller, maybe not at that point. 
How would you describe precocious puberty? Again, these are hormones secreted by the brain has to do with, you know, bringing on puberty. What does precocious mean? It means it comes too early. Now you think uh, puberty, you think of only women. Well, think of a little boy six years old with a beard because that can happen too. It's not just the female getting period and breast early, but it's also the boys too. They get hair on their chest, which is you know unusual. So we can give medications to stop it um, up to the point where they should be going through puberty. About ages 12 is usually what they consider. Congenital hypothyroidism. Now, congenital hypothyroidism, sometimes we know because the mother has a problem or it's familiar history, but sometimes we don't know. And how would we figure it out? Well, any infant who doesn't have a bowel movement in the first two to three days, we are going to consider hypothyroidism. So we are going to be doing, you know, testing for it to make sure that's what they have. Because if we don't have thyroid hormone, we've already talked about growth. They're not going to grow right. And they're going to have severe cognitive delays. And sometimes that's when they find out they don't find it at birth. So hypothyroidism and giving thyroid hormones, very important to the growth and for the mental abilities of an infant. What acid-base alteration would you see in a diabetic child with two small respirations? Well, you think cool smalls, you're thinking diabetic ketoacidosis, right? So that is a metabolic acidosis. So if you think about Kuzmol, it's trying to go against it. So it's opposite that. It's trying to correct out that acid-base balance. And it's meta respiratory alkalosis. So one's metabolic and the other one's respiratory. That is the opposite. It is metabolic acidosis. So we're gonna have respiratory alkalosis. It's trying to equal out those two acid-base balances. A multi-select. What would a child with Cushing syndrome look like? You know, Cushing syndrome is too much steroids in the system, too much cortisol could be due to, you know, that you've been giving too many steroids or too high of a dose. And these children, big round face, just like adults, they're going to be thick and, and heavy looking, but skinny arms, skinny legs usually. And then they're going to have this hair growth, you know, hair on their chins and little mustaches, little kids, not like normal. Um, now, once you stop the steroids and taper them off slowly, all of those things should go away. Seizures in children most often are the result of what? So seizures in children are that abrupt rise in body temperature, okay? The thing about temperatures in children, I've had many parents run into the emergency room. Oh my God, my baby has a temperature of 104. Oh my God, baby, something's gonna happen. Now, the thing is, once they have a fever, the chances of seizures are down to minimal. It's when they don't have a fever and it rises quick that's when the body says, oh my God, the tents got here too quick. And the brain says, oh no, and goes into a seizure. An autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland, usually females, late child, late school age, adolescents. It's one of those thyroid diseases. What is it called? And it's called Hashimoto's. And this is lifelong. 
There's no surgical intervention. You don't do surgery. It's an autoimmune disease. And all they do need is replacement of the thyroid hormones. Addison's disease. Talked about Cushing's. Opposite of Cushing is Addison. This is adrenal gland. Something's going on. What do the adrenal glands do? They secrete cortisol and aldosterone. So if you don't have enough and there's children who don't make it on their own, they're going to be have to take cortisol and aldosterone in some manner in order to get the level where they need to be. And it's always regulated. Um, sometimes stress and sometimes infections makes the, the need more. And then you just give more. But Addison is not enough. Cushing's is too much. A multi-select. A ventricular peritoneal shunt. Ventricle in the brain. Peritoneum in the abdomen. There's a tube that connects. And you can see it there in the picture. Goes from the brain behind the ear. And it goes down in the front into the peritoneum. It is used for children that have too much, quote, water on the brain too much cerebral spinal fluid and the body doesn't know how to get rid of it. So these heads are big. So they put the shunt in to keep that fluid from building up in the head. Now nursing care of it. Now behind the ear, there, there's this little pouch, this little round area that you could push in and out, but never, never, never do it. That's only for the neurosurgeon to do it. Nursing care, you're going to be measuring those head circumferences and abdominal circumferences on these children to make sure, is it getting bigger or is it smaller so that you can see how is that shunt working? One of the side effects of ventricular peritoneal shunts is sometimes they malfunction and they come into the emergency room and what do they complain of? Well, they're getting fluid in their head. Symptoms, vomiting and headache. And it is a true and real emergency. A common sign of Graves' disease includes blank or protrusion of the eyes. Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. Exophthalmus, yes it is. Ever see those new commercials on those eye drops they have? And the lady with the sunglasses and they should keep taking off a pair and there's another pair underneath. And she takes the medicine and she's better. A multi-select. What are signs of a hyperparathyroidism? Now, the parathyroid, what does it do? What, what does it regulate in the body? It has nothing to do with thyroid hormones. It functions in another manner. And the parathyroid has everything to do with calcium. Okay, when you think of calcium, read questions about calcium or even magnesium, think of muscles, okay? Too much, you're gonna be in spasms, tetany. Too little, you're not gonna have control of your muscles, okay? So parathyroids, all about calci uh, calcium in the body. Multi-select. Hypoparathyroidism has symptoms of tetanic muscle contractions and what? Hypoparathyroid. Well, hypoparathyroid, parathyroid's calcium. So hypo, below, low calcium levels, you'll see the tetany and of course muscle weakness because you don't have those electrolytes that are needed for muscle contractions. Calcium, magnesium, as I said, they're both the same, very similar. What does the parathyroid hormone do? I think you know this one now. So that regulates the calcium in the blood. Very good. 
Good job. The point was well made. Which of the following may cause an adrenal crisis, an Addisonian crisis? Addison's disease, right? Remember, the adrenals have everything to do with cortisol and aldosterone. So Addison's disease or Addisonian crisis could be due to that abrupt withdrawal from steroids. That's why we taper them off. It's such an important thing. Has nothing to do with fluid. It has to do with cortisol and aldosterone. That's all it has to do with. A multi-select. A congenital hypoplasia parent-teaching should be taught. Now, one of the things that the um, brain and the pituitary glands do is assign sex to your child. It makes your child a boy or a girl. Now, sometimes children are born with both sexes. I've seen a penis with a vagina I've seen testicles with a vagina. And then you have to determine what are you going to call that baby? Is it a boy or girl? They'll do ultrasounds, they'll do genetic testings, hormones, find out what the closest sex should be. And that's what they make the child. So they have to do a gender assignment on them. These children are going to need cortisol and aldosterone. They don't have enough into their body. And because they don't have all the body parts, this child will always be infertile, no matter what. They're not able to have children. What causes type one diabetes? So diabetes is those beta cells in the pancreas are being destroyed by our own bodies. It's that autoimmune process. So you don't have any of those beta cells to produce insulin that you need to be able to digest carbohydrates. What statement about a pheochromocytoma is correct? This is a tumor that goes on the adrenal glands. And it's a very difficult uh, tumor to be able to diagnose. We diagnose it mostly because of the symptoms that the patient presents with. So a pheochromocytoma is this tumor that secretes adrenaline. It secretes norepinephrine and dopamine, what's normally in the body. So when we have all of these things that are catecholamines or sympathetic, what are you going to see? You're going to see elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, but it's like for these bursts, you know, it's like a, the, the gland secretes this, this um, catecholamine, all of a sudden heart rate's up, blood pressure's up. The patient will feel like fluttering in the chest, tightness in the chest and just not feeling good. And then it goes away. So monitoring this, this patient they're not going to figure out what's going on. They're going to look at the heart first, see what's happening with that. And then hopefully we find a situation where they see all of a sudden the heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, and they'll be able to say, okay, there was no other reason for it, but now let's go look for those adrenals, see what's happening. And that's when they find the tumor. A multi-select. What action should a nurse implement in the care of a patient with a pheochromocytoma? And you get a patient suspected, maybe it's a pheochromocytoma. What are you going to do to help with that diagnosis? What are you going to do to, you know, document this? And we are going to monitor for elevated heart rate and blood pressure because that's what it does. All the other stuff has nothing to do with it. It's heart rate and it's the uh, blood pressure. A multi-select. Nursing care of the unconscious child include. Now, when we talk about a child unconscious, 
and we know it's total nursing care, it doesn't matter child, adult, we do the same care for both. Don't assume that because they're a child, they're not gonna have all those side effects that an adult does because they do. So we're gonna be doing that neuro check every two hours. We're going to be doing vital signs, monitoring INO, turning, positioning, keeping them dry with a, either a pad or a diaper. Um, pain control is part of it, but it's the other nursing care that's the most important. Symptoms of DKA are what? You know, I've had many a DKA patients come into the emergency room. And initially these children are pale, they're diaphoretic, they are in wheelchairs because they're so, you know, exhausted. They, they have no energy, they're leaning over and they feel horrible. You put them in a room, you close the door and you smell this smell, this fruity breath smells like putting a peach in a Tupperware container putting it in the refrigerator for a month, taking it out and opening it and smelling that rotten peach. That's exactly the smell that you will smell. It's because of all the sugar that's in the body. Now, what happens with DKA? You don't have insulin, right? There's no insulin in the body to take care of sugar. So your sugars are really, really high. And then the body says, you know, I'm hungry. I can't get sugars. It's not letting me, you know, convert them, give me food. So what do I do? Well, let me go for the proteins. So you go and they start, the body eats the proteins and the side product is ketonuria. So you just have that fruity smell. It's all the sugar. And then you have the ketonuria because the body's getting something to eat through the proteins. Simply. DKA is caused by what? So no insulin, like I just said, right? And then they go to other fuels for energy, like the proteins, okay? You have carbohydrates, proteins, and fats in the body, and your body absorbs and uses them for nutrition. Can't get sugar, we're going to go for the proteins. A diabetic child complains of feeling jittery and the blood sugar is 45. What's the best treatment for this child? You know, throughout nursing and all your NCLEX questions, and even on your NCLEX, they're going to give you questions like this. What you need to look at is the child is complaining of feeling jittery, so they're awake and alert. The patient condition, awake and alert. Give them something to eat. Orange juice is a good one. Milk is a good one. Turkey sandwich is a good one. Something to feed them to get rid of that blood sugar, to put it up. Your patient has experienced a head injury. What would most concern you? So head injury, swelling in the brain, pituitary glands in there, and you start to see that urinary output start to decrease. So you're swelling in the brain. Very important concept to remember that urinary output and to look at it. I, Intake and output is one of the most important things. Multi-select. What would alert you that a child's head injury is deteriorating? So you're gonna see nausea, but it's there. You're gonna see progressing nausea to profuse vomiting. You're gonna see a headache, but not just a headache, it's gonna get more severe that it, you can't control it with medicines, okay? So vomiting a lot 
headache really severe. And then of course, change in orientation, difficult to arouse. And then becoming restless again is telling you something's going on, difficult to arouse, that head injury is getting worse. We need to do something. A child's been diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. What is your nursing priority of care? What do we need to do for this child? Bacterial meningitis. What's the most important thing in this care? And that's giving those antibiotics because bacterial meningitis, the only way to take care of that is antibiotics because it's a bacteria. What is the primary cause of injury associated with submersion? And that is hypoxia because water's gone in, the, the patient, the child can't breathe. So hypoxemia is the primary injury. A multi-select. A CSF lab results correlates with bacterial meningitis diagnosis. What are you going to see? Do so you do a spinal tap? for a child suspected with meningitis. Well, number one, if you see it white and milky colored, those are white blood cells. That's going to be definitely positive. But you also are gonna be looking at glucose and protein. Now, bacteria love to eat. They love sugar, so glucose is low. And then you're going to see elevated protein. It's just part of what you will see. And you go, yep, okay, now I'm saying that we're gonna be need to be giving this child some antibiotics. Definite positive bacterial meningitis. Last question. A hyperfunction of the pituitary gland in the pre-adolescence results in what? Hyperfunction. And that's gigantism. Absolutely, too much, too little. It depends on their growth, et cetera. And it's probably something, a tumor that we have to remove. RH, number three, number two. Jaden, <laughs> and number one, Jill. Good job, guys. Good job, Jill, with the funny ears and the pig faces. Sandy and Lisa, good job, guys. <laughs> so you can have fun and still win games, right? I love it. What I'd like you to do is please sign your attendance attestations. Make sure you get that done, okay? Um, what I'd like you to do is anybody wants their exams, quick send me a, a message and I'll get them to you as soon as I possibly can. And thank you very much. You know, next week is Memorial Weekend. Hopefully Monday you'll be able to catch up on some little stuff, I hope for you. And I will see you all again next week. Bye guys, thank you so much. I may not with you. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Bogart, can I ask you a question? You sure may. Are we supposed to submit 